reminder as you all, as you all join today's session. Um, this is a two-part webinar today. Um, part one um, will focus primarily on the business side of the um, solution and the approach that Geomain is offering. And part two, which is at the same time tomorrow, uh, Friday, 7th of July, we'll, do a, we'll take a little deeper dive into the technology behind it and do some walking through some case studies, et cetera. So um, Sola is going to be with us for two days and I look forward to you joining us um, as we move forward um, and, and, and demonstrating what Geomain has to offer in terms of universal digital ID and the birth of the East Stamp. So let me just give a brief introduction to Seoul um, and what Seoul has been doing. So Seoul um, has been a serial entrepreneur since the age of 17, and he started his first business while studying for his double bachelor's in computer science and business administration at Webster University in London. Um, he decided to become a management consultant after a string of uh, startup and uh, startup businesses. Um, but there wasn't enough adrenaline pumping to keep him going in this. So in 2003, he formed a joint venture, with, which was what was then the UK's largest location-based services business, and he called it Celltrack. Celltrack went on to become the world's largest managed white label LBS business, LBS services company in the world, location-based services, and uh, that worked with repeated wireless telco zero uh, worldwide on a zero capex revenue share basis. It was of one of only five companies at the time, apart from Nokia, Alcatel, Siemens, Ericsson, and Huawei, to have developed their own turnkey LBS services um, solution offered by the telcos. And Celltrack offered more consumer LBS services than any of its competitors. Several of those uh, white label products that sold design are still being used by over 100 million telco subscribers globally today. Now, I'm going to hand over to Seoul, who will be able to explain a little more about um, what Geomain is doing and um, how, we, how, how this came to be. Um, I do notice that Michael has raised his hand. Um, the way we are working today, folks, is that as an attendee, um, your questions can be posted in the chat. And in the Q&A box, we'll monitor the questions there. Uh, we, we ideally would like you to, to use the Q&A uh, function in Zoom. Um, but if you post in the chat, you can indicate quite clearly that um, there is a um, question in the chat. Uh, I see there were some comments that there was a challenge with, with audio, but I'm glad to hear that it's working now. Um, so I think we're all ready to go. Um, I see many of you have joined. Fantastic for you to join today. So over to you, Sol. Um, oh, by the way, I'm Tracy Hackshaw. I'm um, the chef de projet, um, the Dot Post Business Management Unit. Um, so I'm responsible for the Dot Post um, team. And with me, as well as Miss Sam Sebra, who works with me in the Dot Post team. And I hope that um, as part of this exercise, you will also consider. Uh, working with Dot Post and in your own efforts to um, make your post more resilient and more secure. But having said that, uh, over to you and Michael. Uh, if you have a question or or comment, I think you could post it in the chat. So, so over to you. Thank you very much, Tracy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it, thank you very much for the introduction that you made. Uh, so most of you already know exactly my background, where I've come from. I've been with location-based services for the better part of the last two decades. Uh, it's uh, not just my work, it's also my passion. Um, so we started Geomain back in 2016, and after several iterations, uh, we finally reached where we think it's a great uh, product and one that would be of tremendous uh, benefit to the postal services, and hence our uh, discussions had started with the UPU almost a couple of years ago, and uh, we are indeed honored to be members uh, of uh, both the Consultative Council as well as the DOT Post Group. 
it's uh, uh, it, 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 it's something that we obviously very uh, you know value very much and we cherish it and uh, we look forward to uh, working with the UPU uh, to launch uh, exciting products for uh, postal operators globally uh, of which eStamp is uh, going to be one of the major uh, and, and 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 the main products really uh, so uh, this 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 particular presentation will uh, shed some light on exactly how the eStamp will work uh you know what it is based on uh, which is the digital id uh, so uh, without any further delay i will jump straight into the presentation at this time uh, uh tracy can you see my screen i believe i can i'm just um, confirming with everyone else that they can see it yes if you if you can see it in the chat just let us know if you can see so screen or if you don't if you don't see that doesn't know but so I can see it go ahead we, we can see it you can see it. you can see it. great thank you very much okay uh so I'll just move to uh, the second slide, which basically says, what is a uh, universal digital ID? So universal digital identity is a parameter that uniquely identifies an individual organization or even an electronic device. Uh, at this uh, at this moment in time, uh, you know, there the, the whole concept of digital identity is actually evolving. Uh, so the timing, I think, is perfect, uh, um, you know, for the UPU uh, to come in on this and, uh, you know, launch services and products based on a universal digital identity. Uh, uh, you know, we have some some fragmented initiatives, uh, you know, uh, that, that currently exist, uh, but these are primarily by a handful of players and they do not, by any stretch of the imagination, have a global acceptances yet so this is very very critical because once uh, uh, if if a product has been launched and that has global uh, acceptance and recognition then the challenge becomes significantly higher to do something that would then be able to help and facilitate post in this fashion so uh, there is no true digital identity at the moment uh, uh, which is available to everybody and i believe that the upu as the custodian with support of member post offices are therefore ideally positioned to launch and facilitate the global adoption of a universal digital identity uh, in doing so uh, or it's going to address the uh, the falling postal volumes is going to significantly enhance revenues and and the operational efficiencies as well whilst also significantly lowering costs uh, costs as we know is a, a major factor uh, there's been a cross the board increase in uh, costs of doing business and uh, they have a direct impact on the operating margins uh, for post which already are uh, very thin so we we feel that this opportunity shall also ensure post to stay relevant for decades to come so it's it's it's, it's absolutely important uh, that uh, you know we be, we are able to get this right and we have the support of all the postal partners which is what we're looking for um sorry i'm just okay right so uses and utility of a of a universal digital identity so any good uni, uh, universal digital identity should actually empower consumers to sign into apps and websites so you have a common uh, parameter that you can use to sign on uh, it should be able to identify a physical address or location, uh, especially in the case of a, a universal digital identity that the UPU would endorse, uh, primarily because of the very uh, nature of the UPU's uh, fundamental work, which is post and delivering mail. Uh, it should also uh, be something that can help uh, users conduct transactions securely uh, and uh, you know validate subscriptions, validate submissions, and perhaps even uh, you know have a, have a function for uh, e-signatures. Uh, so um, unlike some walled garden initiatives that exist today, uh, the utility of a true universal digital identity, we believe should actually transcend any specific platform application and or use cases and should be universally available to every person on earth and for free. So uh, once again, this, uh, in, you know, in our opinion, this is uh, something that uh, the UPU is uniquely qualified to be able to bring to the table for the benefit of all, especially because the UPU is an agency of the United Nations, uh, which obviously has, uh, as we all know, is uh, is a is a global body that looks after interests of uh, every of every citizen on Earth. So. Uh, 
a lot of people at this moment use an email to connect to for services and uh, uh, you know online uh, email uh, software etc but almost every app or website today uh, that that uses username or password authentication system um, are actually suffering significant costs uh, because of the inherent uh, way that emails uh, that username and passwords have been structured this is a technology that's more than two decades old um, and uh, even single sign-on solutions like uh, Google uh, so, you know uh, sign up with Google sign up with Facebook etc all of these uh, SSO solutions as we call them are fundamentally still they use the username and password so um, just because you don't have to enter a username and password uh, when you sign on to services does not really mean that it is something that is devoid of a user of, of the inherent insecurities that exist within the username password with combination. Uh, so some of the problems that uh, we, we see today with, uh, with, you know, with email and username uh, password combination are they inherently secure, they compromise user privacy. When you share your email uh, on websites and on apps to register, then you're essentially fueling spam, which in itself is a major, major problem. Uh, and uh, there's a huge recurring uh, you know, time and compute costs to reset and restore passwords. So um, all in all, this is really a very, very uh, old solution. Uh, as I said, more than 20 years old. Uh, so it's something that really needs to be redone uh, based on the technology that exists today. Um, universal digital identity, you feel is a missing link for digital empowerment. So uh, when we talk of digital empowerment, it's actually the result of digital transformation now. Uh, you know, most organizations, um, including the, the UPU, is uh, uh, in the middle of digital transformation. Uh, they are a big supporter of it, uh, primarily because it, it is something that is uh, obviously to the benefit of everybody. Uh, uh, but however, uh, digital uh, transformation is really only possible when we are able to securely connect people with a digital ecosystem. So. Uh, the, the missing link that, that we feel which exists today between uh, having a, a digitally empowered nation and a uh, uh, you know, digital ecosystem is, is really a digital identity. So we are using a very old method to connect to a digital ecosystem, and that's why we are unable to harness the full benefits of a digital ecosystem. Uh, so um, email passwords, as we know, pretty much every single organization on the planet at the moment that has customer uh, onboarding uh, uses the same method. Um, there's a huge collective cost, which is suffered by all stakeholders actually due to this thing. So organizations lose billions of dollars in loss efficiencies, financial and reputational costs. Uh, we've all heard of cases where uh, passwords have been stolen, um, you know, even the big techs, uh, the, you know, the Amazons and, uh, you know, the major uh, other e-commerce players, uh, etc., Twitter as well, uh, none of them have actually been spared this. So the hackers are very persistent to ensure that they are able to cause as much disruption as possible uh, to, uh, to businesses and to consumers both. Uh, and, and this obviously results in a significant loss for all companies because they they have to buy additional software, security software, they have to buy insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, consumers lose uh, on average 16 billion hours on average, just recovering lost passwords. Uh, this is a study that was done and the link is uh, shown over there. So that, that, that statement there just kind of gives you a fair idea of the scale of the problem that we currently face. Uh, now, the fact that most of us are currently uh, conditioned to a large degree uh, to using username and passwords because we have historically been doing that um, uh, is is really no defense uh, we need to think outside the box and come up with a solution that uh, is 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 really you know uh, fit for our current times and based on uh, existing uh, technologies so uh, the universal digital identity is therefore the missing link that we feel will eliminate and mitigate a lot of these losses to a significantly large degree so now we'd like to introduce the GeoMain Universal Digital ID. Uh, so in the case of GeoMain, uh, our Universal Digital Identity is an alphanumeric parameter that can be up to 27 characters long and is prefixed with a right facing chevron called a Geo. So it looks uh, like those examples you see below. 
So it could be as simple as Adam one uh, dot SG for Singapore. Uh, then you, you know you could have a star CAF. Uh, you could have uh, a, a sub geomains as well are supported in this, and you could even have premium geomains which are three characters, uh, two, three, and four character, and they do not have a country suffix. So those are called premium geomains. So uh, the way that you would identify a geomain is with the right chevron. So anything that's got a right chevron. Uh, prefixed uh, would actually then resolve to a geomains. Uh, so uh, this is how uh, this is going to be working uh, um, because we will be building add-ons for browsers that can actually handle this kind of, uh, uh, you know, resolving uh, on the on, at the browser's end. So let's have a look at the highlights of the Geomain universal digital identity. So uh, the Geomain ID is actually available in most languages, most global languages, because we support seven different character sets, uh, which uh, include English, obviously, uh, uh, as well as Arabic, uh, Hindi, Japanese, Korean, Mandarin, and Russian. Um, and every single uh, Geomain would actually have a matching QR code format uh, because uh, this is something that we would uh, need uh, in order to be able to empower the e stamps that we are talking about. Uh, the, the, the second critical thing to remember is that uh, the Geomains are uh, free for life for consumers. So you download the app and you're able to register a Geomain. Uh, you could do that today. Uh, the links for both the Google and Apple Play Store are there. And uh, once you've actually registered your Geomain, uh, then uh, you know, you're know you basically, uh, you, you, you qualify as having a universal digital identity. Uh, and then the use cases that, that will come with the universal digital identity uh, are, are all available and open to you. Uh, businesses will pay a small annual fee uh, for registering a Geomain, and that's really our revenue model. Um, and uh, what we would like is we would like the uh, the, uh, the UPU's uh, postal uh, members uh, to become a part of this uh, in order to be able to uh, on revenue streams uh, from this particular business. And those uh, are significant as we will see further down. Um, so Geomin is actually structured a bit like it's, 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 you know, the modeling is based on the ICANN and the domain name model. So post offices essentially act as registrars, they earn revenue streams, uh, mostly recurring. Um, and, uh, you know, we would like uh, for the UP to have some kind of an oversight or regulatory uh, 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 engagement uh, in the running of uh, the Geomain registry. So that is what we are hoping would happen. Uh, and and uh, finally, of course, it's available in the app format to anyone with a smartphone, which I mentioned already. And at the moment, if we just look at the, uh, you know, what is what is the scope of this? So we've got about 6.9 billion uh, smartphone users in the world today, and that pretty much covers about 86.11%. So from a penetration perspective, uh, we, you know, there, there really couldn't be a more effective tool than uh, launching a universal digital identity in the format of an app because everybody is able to uh, use an app and uh, we have uh, significantly high uh, penetration globally of smartphones today. Uh, okay, we'll go down to the next slide and um, this is a live uh, a live use case we have for a uh, Geomain uh, universal digital identity. It's, a, it's, it's actually called Geox. It's a sign in and a sign up solution. Uh, so here, um, this is the, this we feel is something that is uh, all uh, you know going to be uh, significantly useful uh, for people once they've actually downloaded the Geomain. So uh, remember, a Geomain is a digital identity uh, on its own. There's very little you could do with it, but it's it's really the use cases of Geomain mean that will uh, matter and 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 that's where you really uh, you know really see the power of 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 geomain working so here uh, geox has actually got a small uh, you know short video so i will try and run that video uh, and if by like most people you're annoyed by passwords you've got dozens to remember and on any given day as you read emails send tweets and order all I'm so that the audio is gone. You have to put, turn back up the audio, please. I'm sorry. The audio has gone. You need to turn back up the audio. And so you, it was you were uh, here before. Now it's gone. Oh, the audio is gone. Should I? Okay, hold on. Uh, 
no the, the volume is max here let me let me try again yeah try again it was working before and then it went away Can you hear it? Should I continue? No, there's no audio. Um, try again. Still no audio. Um, so it doesn't seem to be. Um, is there a link to this? Uh, maybe you could put a link in the chat so that people can. can um, okay. Can, All right. Okay. So we'll just go back to the thing. Okay. My apologies for that. I don't know if that's a YouTube video. It, the audio should be running. But it's not okay. So this is basically just a sign, uh, a, a sign-on app, uh, or, or rather a sign-on solution, um, and an authenticator app to go with it. So uh, once you actually have your Geomain digital identity, um, you can enter that into any supporting website or app, and you would receive a notification on your device uh, asking you to confirm that you are indeed signing in or signing up to a particular website or app. And once you confirm that by swiping the screen, uh, then you are, you are granted access. So this is a very interesting use case and uh, please do go and watch the video so you can have a very good idea of how this works and how convenient life becomes once you start using the Geomain digital ID for sign-on purposes uh, using Geox technology. Okay, uh, the birth of the e-stamp. So every geomain has a unique QR code, as I earlier mentioned, and this actually allowed us to create a exciting product, which we call the digital e-stamp. Um, and the way it works is that uh, we, sender has a geomain, we add, uh, and you know, who then basically decides uh, he or she wants to send a package or a parcel to the recipient who also have a, has, has a geomain. So um, based on both their geomains, uh, our algorithm generates a unique QR code, which, uh, which would then be a rich QR code. And you'll come to that, I believe, on the next slide. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and this can be scanned by post and it would be able to uh, have all the necessary information, including address, including uh, you know, any, any kind of custom information, Etc. that would be required. Uh, very important to, uh, so to note here that uh, this is not a value QR code stamp or we have some, uh, uh, you know, we have seen some countries launch uh, value, uh, value QR code stamps, which have, uh, which are single use, uh, but, 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 you know, they're, they're, they're value QR code stamps. So hypothetically, if, if those value QR code stamps are stolen, then uh, they could be abused. Uh, but in the case of the e-stamp, uh, because it is uh, unique to a particular letter or parcel, i.e. A unique, unique to a particular transaction. So what happens is that uh, even if this, you know, if, even if once an e-stamp is generated, uh, it is stolen, there is absolutely nothing that the thief could do with the e-stamp primarily because it would only list the recipient as the destination. So uh, this is something that is very, very important. And that has, uh, uh, you know, uh, that some post offices that we have spoken to find uh, extremely interesting. So how does the e-stamp function? Um, we've actually got a uh, app module that uh, that could be uh, provided as a white labeled uh, solution, which could then be embedded within existing uh, app for any postal operator, um, or it could be available, made available as standalone if if you know if so desired. So we are fairly flexible on that. And the way that it would really work is if you look at these uh, four screenshots. So the first would really be where the uh, the owner of the, the uh, of, of the app would actually just choose a recipient and enter the service details. So they would say, look, I want to buy an e-stamp and I want to send this uh, to uh, the enter recipient geomain field is over there. So you can either write that down, so choose it from your contact list, or you can scan that. And then you actually choose what is uh, it that you want to send. So is it a letter? Is it a parcel? So so those are essentially like drop down uh, menus that you can scroll and select. Uh, and the same for the weight, the same for the kind of service that you want in terms of the same day, next day, uh, etc. And uh, even for any other additional add on services that post office uh, currently offers, uh, i.e. is it registered mail? Is it recorded delivery, etc. So once you've actually done that then you uh, you click on next uh, and you come to the uh, you, uh, you're asked to confirm the details and at that moment the, the this particular um, 
e-stamp is priced based on the uh, destination and origin uh, and the uh, package or letter uh, uh, data that you have selected. Um, so uh, once you're happy with the price, you actually select on to buy the e-stamp uh, and, and you then go ahead and make that payment using whatever method uh, is, is currently supported by the post offices and their payment processors. And once that payment is successfully processed, uh, then the e-stamp is issued. The e-stamp is, again, is soft uh, it's, it's in soft copy, but you have an option of uh, actually printing it out. Uh, you could share it and you could even save it for future use. So um, uh, this is very important to note that the e-stamp is not something that uh, the post offices themselves would have to print out unless they choose to. Uh, it is something that users would be able to do in-app, uh, you know, from the convenience of their homes uh, or offices, and they would be able to generate these e-stamps and uh, they'd be able to make the shipments. Uh, why do we feel that the e-stamp will revolutionize post uh, globally? Uh, so this is the current system that we are uh, that we've had for the last several decades. So uh, you know we have to write or print an address. We play the, uh, you know we then place a stamp onto the envelope, or we use franking machines at times if it's uh, a volume mail by usually by corporates or government agencies. Uh, then. Uh, there is obviously a cost uh, of uh, printing and storing stamps, uh, you know, which the post office currently bears. Uh, there's a lack of address integrity, uh, illegible addresses, and sometimes no return addresses. So uh, we all know that uh, that return return mail is a significant problem for a lot of postal operators. Uh, then there's a relatively high processing and handling cost associated with the existing system. Um, and the current uh, si system that we have is basically based on a weight and dimension metrics only. Um, there is zero provenance, so we do not know, uh, you know if, this, if this address has any kind of uh, provenance data. Is it even valid? Is it not valid? Uh, and then the, uh, you know, there are some tracking solutions available, uh, primarily for high-value shipments, uh, which uh, uh, which are which, which border on pretty much the same solution that couriers offer, where you can track a mail, but uh, they are they are very uh, few or far between, uh, and they are primarily the premium services that post offices today offer. Uh, then there's a very high cost to mitigate language barriers globally. So uh, if, if somebody were to actually write a address in Mandarin, then it would be very difficult to actually resolve that address by a post office, uh, let's say in the US. Uh, so we have all of those kind of issues. And then of course it's, it's fraud prone because uh, those stamps that can that, that for some reason have missed being postmarked, uh, you know, can then be reused. Uh, so the e-stamp, uh, on the contrary, uh, uh, you know, the, the onus of printing and, and sticking the stamp is now uh, on the consumer. Um, uh, we've got 100% address integrity because we know that the geomin is valid, the geomin exists, and we know the exact address. Um, uh, the processing and handling costs are low. Um, uh, and, and we know that because when it comes to sorting uh, within the post offices, uh, with sorting centers, then uh, currently OCR technology is used, uh, which is uh, which we, we all know is fairly uh, expensive, even though the costs have come down, but it's still more expensive than uh, scanning QR codes. And for that matter, QR codes uh, scanning would be a lot uh, faster as well. Uh, then we've got actually multiple pricing metric capabilities. So uh, at this moment in time, uh, the, the whole pricing is, is actually determined i believe by uh, um, agreements that that have been made between nations and countries um, and those agreements uh, primarily were made when it was impossible to actually determine uh, distances for each specific piece of mail but for the first time now using the e-stamp uh, we are able to actually determine uh, more or less the approximate distance between uh, the seller and the uh, i'm sorry between the sender and the recipient and by virtue of that if the UP you so wishes and at any point in the future the e-stamp can be adopted to be uh, to be priced uh, based on actual distances so it could be perhaps you know some some would call it you know, perhaps fairer pricing um, then we've got a full trail and real-time tracking of every single letter um, and, and I'll show you how that works in the next slide or two uh, we've got proof of delivery notifications and other value-added services that could then be uh, built on this primarily because it's all digital uh, we've got zero fraud because as I explained even if this is stolen there's no way that 
anybody could reroute or redirect the east app to uh, to another different uh, geomain it would it would always be locked into that particular geomain although that geomain if the person is traveling into different countries then the mail can be redirected uh, and that's the next and last point here so reroute letters in transit for a fee so um, hypothetically if, uh, if if somebody sends me a letter and i happen to be in uh, singapore at the time uh, however i didn't hop on a plane and i'm in london uh, and i update my geo mail so a notification is then uh, uh, received uh, by me saying uh, well uh, this this letter is in transit and if you would like it to if you if you would like this letter to be rerouted to you in london then and, uh, you know, this is the extra fee that you need to pay. And insofar as I agree to pay that fee, then that, that letter can then be very conveniently rerouted to my updated address in London. So again, this is a very uh, something that's totally unique and simply not available at this moment, uh, even from any of the major courier companies. So it's something that would be a USB, I believe, for uh, postal operators globally. Okay, so let's let's uh, delve a bit deeper into the e stamp and uh, <clears throat> excuse me how it works and uh, it's you know the universal framework for regulatory compliance. So, um, as 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 we all know, there is a, a significant uh, digitization of uh, customs and uh, um, you know border uh, rules and regulations at this moment in time. Uh, there is a effort to kind of uh, centralize all of that into a single uh, QR code or into a single data set. And um, uh, the e-stamp actually has been built in a way that it can allow for these kind of uh, uh, records to be appended to an existing e-stamp. So every time that I generate the e-stamp um, insofar as if there are any custom regulations or any other uh, factors or, or, or any of the border rules that need to apply, then those additional uh, questionnaires can be embedded uh, within the app that I just uh, you know, showed you some screenshots of. And insofar as those forms are then completed, then that data, uh, that entire data and record for that unique transaction can then be appended within the e-stamp. So essentially, it's just going to be one standard QR code. Uh, so let's look at at, uh, you know, from top to down. So we've got a consignee name, which can be shown in up to two languages. So Sarah Adams here, but if we wish to have that name in, in Japanese or in uh, Arabic or Hindi, then, you know, we could actually have that as well. So that that really depends on the consumer um, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, if, if he or she, uh, what is the language of geomain that he or she is using. Um, uh, so, um, this is primarily there because in case if there is any uh, uh, any any issue with the packaging or what have you uh, or at point of delivery for that matter the post office uh, sorry the postman can actually identify that this package belongs to a person called sarah adams and uh, you know so so at least they know who, who the recipient is uh, which is obviously critical uh, then we've got a unit the unit is a unique mail id it serves as an online tracking number or backup in case the qr code is defaced or damaged because sometimes that may happen as well uh, during uh, during shipment uh, you know if, if, if a few drops of rain water or whatever they fall on the qr code uh, if the ink isn't very strong then the ink could disperse so we've got this number here uh, which can be uh, much more easily read and the other benefit of having this unique number is that apart from the fact it can also double as a tracking number and it does um, it can actually be even handwritten onto an envelope or a package. So let's say if somebody actually generates an e-stamp on their device, uh, and then uh, for as long as OCR is supported by post offices, uh, which at the moment all post offices support it, uh, but uh, in the future I think it would be, uh, you know, it may be progressively phased off. But until such time that it is, um, then uh, it, 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 you know, this just scribbling the you know, scribbling the UMIT code onto a letter or an or, or a parcel uh, would uh, enable that letter or parcel to be shipped because it would be it would serve the purpose of uh, the e-stamp the issuer logo uh, would go in the center uh, so this is a, just a fictitious post office we, that we created uh, called cyber post um, and uh, we, we actually got a primary route, uh, route id uh, so this is going from siberia that's that's with a cy uh, uh, to uh, the uk which is gb so uh, once you look at the stamp you can pretty much uh, tell that uh, you know uh, where is the origin and where is the destination 
the, the the QR code is uh, unique, uh, uh, as, as I already mentioned, and it and it contains a sender and recipient's geomate, contains a cost. So once you enter this 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 data or you scan this QR code, you would be able to see exactly who sent it, who's receiving it, uh, what is the the cost uh, that was paid for this, uh, what is the weight. Uh, you know which which post office issued it, and what kind of services were chosen, and what the delivery tra uh, delivery tra and tracking status is at that time. Uh, and as I said, other data sets can be appended to this record uh, in terms of the customs checklist and and any other border rules or regulations that would apply uh, for specific countries. So uh, when uh, so that would mean that uh, uh, once you're actually using an e-stamp, so it does pretty much cater to the full gamut of uh, uh, regulations. Uh, that, that that exists and and any any future regulations that come as well uh, it would be uh, technically possible to actually just uh, append that that data set uh, to to this existing uh, record uh, and make it available to the authorities uh, the last thing that we've got at the bottom is we, we you know we've got the price so this is again the fictitious currency for siberia which is uh, siberia with the c um, and uh, we've got the service there so at, at, at one glance uh, you know the, the postman can can see that what is exactly the service that was uh, purchased for the for the delivery of this particular letter or parcel okay uh, <clears throat> now this is important to note that how you know how do efficiencies and cost savings make the east and future proof so delivery efficiencies primarily because of a more accurate GPS based delivery point. So at the moment, uh, as we know, we have historically been using an address, uh, you know, which is a street name, uh, postcode, uh, town, uh, country, etc. So um, here in this particular case, we, you know, we were because we are now uh, we have uh, GPS available pretty much everywhere on the planet. So uh, it makes sense to use GPS, which gives us about a five to 10 meter accuracy. Uh, then uh, the other thing is that Geomin actually gets you to the door every single time, and that uh, that is a feature that you can actually see for yourselves today. If you were to download the Geomin app, uh, you could see that you could upload uh, your uh, instructions in terms of how to get to the door in four different formats. So you could write a text about it saying uh, whatever you wish, uh, you know, in, in instructing the visitor to uh, in terms of how to get to the door. You could upload a video. You could upload a voice message as well, uh, because in some countries, uh, you know, uh, uh, video uh, would, would, would take up more more data so therefore uh, people would perhaps not not watch that many videos because of data restrictions or limitations so you can listen to a voice file and you can also upload pictures so um, the whole idea here being that we are you know we are all aware that the last the last mile is the most significant uh, cost component of any uh, delivery. So here uh, we are actually able to mitigate that cost significantly by being able to provide this information. And very important to note that it is it, it remains in the interest of every single uh, Geomain user to keep that information current and updated uh, himself or herself uh, because he or she would continue to receive deliveries at that address. Uh, uh, so uh, some of the other in, uh, uh, mapping services that are available, that are available today, uh, as we all know, they spend significant amount of money uh, and time trying to update the information. So maps are always in flux from that perspective, uh, and yet uh, the accuracy is, uh, is, is 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 in some cases severely lacking, uh, primarily because uh, at the moment uh, users have no inherent interest of updating that information, and and for that matter, even no platform where they could update it. So Geomain offers uh, users uses a platform where they can update their the, their information uh, in, in, in real time as soon as that information changes. Uh, and, and, and all of this really helps to uh, significantly enhance uh, delivery efficiencies um, uh, for uh, post. And of course, by virtue of, uh, uh, of, of this, uh, we can then uh, basically benefit from uh, a better route optimization. Um, and uh, we could actually even link that to a user's current location. So uh, for example, let's say if a particular package requires the uh, recipient to actually sign for it, uh, we could do a quick check and say, well, you know what, the recipient is currently uh, 
not not in town or not in this country because the geomin is pointed somewhere else so therefore uh, you know it may well be uh, possible to send a notification uh, using uh, again using the geomin stp uh, which is able to actually send a notification asking the user that this package will be delivered uh, would you like it to be delivered at a later date or would you like it to be rerouted so all of these are fantastic services that can be made available um, by uh, you know when we switch to using the e-stamp and all of them of course uh, would help uh, significantly enhance efficiencies and reduce costs so um, uh, talking of costs uh, yes cost savings are going to be there due to virtually zero undeliverable mail so uh, this is this is a huge issue uh, for uh, couriers and post alike that a lot of mail remains undelivered uh, because of address integrity and or other issues so in this particular case we are able to significantly mitigate that uh, if not uh, eliminate that down to zero uh, then minimize the repeat delivery attempts so again this this is uh, got to do with the uh, with the service where we can send short notifications to the uh, end consumer on the geomint platform uh, requesting uh, uh, them to confirm their availability before a delivery attempt is made uh, for those posts and letters which require a signature uh, then we've got automated advanced delivery notification as well. So again, this is for registered mail and sign, uh, you know, sign requests, etc. And uh, cost savings, of course, significantly because of faster and more uh, QR code based sorting rather than the old OCR technology. Okay, so how do these efficiencies and uh, Excuse me. How do these efficiencies and cost savings make the ESTAM future proof? So, if you look at the pain points we have with addresses today, so um, the addresses change every time we relocate. Um, we are now living in a world where mobility is uh, significantly higher than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, so, this is something that we uh, are able to address with a geomain. Uh, then, at this moment in time, the addresses are all globally fragmented in terms of standards. Some countries have post offices, some countries have Postcodes. Uh, some countries have none of the above, so uh, it's 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 a truly fragmented system and one that um, that that does not really have economies of scale. Uh, then addresses uh, currently support local languages only, so uh, we feel that uh, that in that in in using a QR code, we are able to sign significantly uh, address a lot of the problems that. Uh, actually are faced by uh, post offices globally in having to uh, determine what a particular language is is, is reading um, and uh, you know how they're going to deliver that 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 post, that item of parcel or post uh, then uh, addresses are static uh, so one you know an address that exists today is that address and will remain the same address pretty much for uh, you know forever unless and until the municipal authorities decide to rename the road or or, or the numbering system. So um, this is this is something again that that with GeoMain you can actually have a dynamic addressing. So um, wherever you actually are, you know in the app you can go and you can uh, choose your address at any moment uh, uh, for any given location in any country on the planet and uh, that then becomes your updated address. Uh, so really a few clicks and you and your address is updated uh, but however as far as the world is concerned your address is your geomain and that address is for life so um th that won't change but the actual physical address where you are can change at at your will um, the addresses are uh, today that that we have that we see there's there's a uh, you know the the accuracy is 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 poor um, and really only as good as the mapping service. So uh, even even uh, major mapping service providers like Google, uh, there's information on the internet which uh, indicate that uh, as as much as 25 to 30 percent of the time the in the actual addresses uh, are not very accurate and and and, and these experiences that I've myself have, have had uh, in, in a few countries and I'm sure many people have had where uh, you know you, you you would call a cab and the cab would say look I'm here but there is no cab there because they are they're in the road parallel to where you are or something like that so um, uh, so again it's, it's all poor, poor, poor accuracy primarily because uh, maps currently use the reverse geocoding as we know um, uh, so uh, geomain uses GPS uh, and therefore uh, by virtue of that we've got GPS level accuracy and we are mapping 
diagnostic. So insofar as a map can actually display a GPS uh, data set uh, accurately on their own map, then our, our uh, GPS uh, uh, data and then our GPS point would actually be 100% accurate. Uh, so um, the other pain point is uh, addresses are difficult to remember. So here is geomain. That's one word and easy to remember. It's a custom name. So again, very similar to domains. Uh, people tend to remember domains much more easily. Uh, so uh, there's no reason why they would not remember a geomain much more easily rather than four or five lines of text. Uh, addresses today, as we stand, cannot really be, uh, you know, they are, they are not unique and they cannot be branded. Geomain is both unique and branded unique because uh, there's only one geomain for, uh, you know, for, for uh, once you register a geomain and that geomain is unique to you and nobody else can actually have a similar uh, or exactly the same geomain. Um, and then uh, for, for corporates, it could be a very important branding tool uh, where they could actually uh, uh, use a geomain uh, to be able to enhance their brand or their uh, you know corporate brand whatever it is um, because at, if if you look at some of the marketing materials uh, that exist today for example billboards or what have you you would actually have uh, some uh, you know major companies even for starbucks for example uh, you know they would actually have uh, starbucks.com they would have a phone number which would be 1-800 starbucks uh, but then the address uh, you know would actually be actually again be the five or six or more lines of text so if if they could actually just replace that with let's say fifth avenue dot starbucks then that would be something that would uh, help them to boost uh, their branding and would definitely be something that i i believe corporates would actually welcome um, in terms of integrity, uh, addresses are low integrity primarily because uh, whether you're writing them or you're typing them, one is prone to make an error. Uh, and if you make an error, then that would uh, uh, make all the difference between a, a fulfilled delivery and an unfulfilled delivery or lost mail. Uh, so in the case of a geomain, it's high integrity because uh, from a probability perspective, uh, the probability of getting a geomain wrong which is significantly lower, even if you are writing one out. Uh, but if you're using a QR code, then it's uh, basically zero possibility of you to get it wrong. So it's a uh, very high integrity. Um, addresses are government created uh, or municipal created at this moment in time, whereas geomates are self-created. So you get to choose your own address. It could be your name, could be uh, you know your pet's name or whatever you so desire. Anything that you choose and that's available is uh, can be registered uh, you know today and right now as I speak using the geomate app. The other issue is that addresses cannot be uh, are, are not verifiable in real time, uh, whereas a geomain can be verified in real time. Uh, so um, uh, this is you know we've all been through uh, processes uh, of uh, opening bank accounts and perhaps even availing some of the government services where we have to provide uh, utility and electricity bills to prove our address. Uh, so all of that is, uh, if you think about it, fairly cumbersome. Yes, we're all used to it, but uh, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. Uh, with geomain, uh, addresses can be verified in real time. I geomains can be verified in real time. Um, and there is even a possibility of, uh, of, of, of having some, some kind of uh, KYC applications uh, built on this, uh, which I'm sure that uh, other, other uh, tech companies would eventually get on to. Uh, then finally, uh, there's a high handling cost for uh, the OCR technology that, that uh, basically exists today and compared to the QR code technology, which is a, a much more lower cost in terms of handling for the post offices. So again, a cost saving there. Okay, so uh, let's let's try and quantify the financial benefits of an e-stamp opportunity for post. So uh, uh, at the end of the day, it's very important that uh, uh, hostel members are able to uh, increase uh, their different revenue streams uh, because that would uh, help them to be in a stronger position. Uh, so uh, what do we, uh, what what this would actually do is uh, we uh, this would give a whole uh, suite of services uh, that that host could actually uh, start uh, selling. Uh, Again, using, uh, I mean, it's all in the cloud, so it's all SaaS, so there isn't any significant uh, changes that you need to do at your end. Uh, but insofar as uh, basically once once a post office or a postal member agrees, uh, they are able to uh, sign up uh, to Geomain, then, then they 
all these different services become available to them that they can sell. And the way that we work is that host members uh, earn a fee of between 15 to 25% of all revenue collected by the host. Uh, we do not get into collection of any revenues or, or, or any, any kind of uh, funds ourselves. Uh, post offices uh, will be uh, the, the, the entity that will be uh, Taking all the all the revenues and, and collecting uh, directly from the consumers. So uh, let's 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 look at exactly what what all is actually available uh, for the post offices uh, to do. So the post offices can act as a registrar, uh, just like you've got. Uh, GoDaddy's and all these other big companies that are selling domain names and 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 uh, you know making significant amount of revenue. So post offices now have an opportunity to sell domain names uh, to businesses because remember businesses are not free. Uh, so if a business wishes to have wishes to have a domain name, then the business needs to purchase a domain name. Uh, that 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 domain name uh, uh, for businesses is a minimum validity of two years, and the current cost is about nine dollars ninety nine. We'll come to that. I believe in the next slide. Um, so uh, uh, the the minimum registration is for two years. Then they they can sell domain names to some consumers and 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 which which consumers would actually buy it. And the, the fact that you can register a domain for free using your uh, phone number uh, and 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 your app. Um, simply means that you would get a geomain of the format, uh, for example, sarah.sg for Singapore. Now, if you wanted to have something that was perhaps a little more private, say just Sarah, uh, then you would actually uh, want to get rid of the country suffix. The way that you could do that is you could actually purchase a suffix-free geomain. Uh, those are uh, not free. Uh, so a suffix-free geomain is, is, is a geomain that does not have a country suffix at the end. So it, uh, so it uh, basically um, allows for great the privacy from a consumer perspective and if if a person uh, chooses to uh, to enjoy that creative privacy then there's a small fee of about five dollars 99 or, or something of the sort that can actually uh, 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 that the consumer can then acquire a, a suffix free geomain also short geomain so if somebody wants a geomain called tom for example uh, then uh, geomain actually uh, we've got uh, you know premium geomain names and these are five characters uh, or, or well, less than five characters actually. Uh, so if you uh, so something like AA or uh, or, or ABC or or you know uh, Tommy uh, T O M I uh, would all be premium domain names, and these are uh, uh, these actually have a surcharge in addition to the annual fee uh, that is otherwise charged for them as well. And again, these are available to both corporates and to consumers. Then renewal and category upgrade of domain names. This is also an important revenue stream because uh, remember uh, that uh, domains typically have, I believe reading somewhere that they have a, a, a renewal rate of somewhere about 86%. So uh, we, we, you know, we feel that domains uh, would not be very different to that. And uh, a lot of people who would actually have domains would be renewing them, uh, uh, both consumers and companies as well, uh, insofar as they continue to exist. And those uh, those renewal uh, costs uh, or, or, or revenue from renewals uh, would be uh, recurring revenue. Uh, where then in some cases, uh, people would have a, a personal domain or they may buy a, buy a domain, but then decide to upgrade it to business category. Um, and if they decide to upgrade upgrade to business category, then a, a slightly higher uh, fee applies. And again, all of that is shared with the post offices. Uh, validation of domain names. So this is uh, like, I, I can register a domain name today insofar as if I have an email and I have if a, a valid phone number, mobile phone number anywhere on the planet, then I will be able to get the geomain. Uh, however, uh, if uh, you know some services like perhaps government e-services, perhaps some corporates or some banks may require your geomain to be validated. So validation essentially means that you would need to take your government issued ID uh, to the local post office and say, well, look, this is my geomain and this is my government ID. Can you please authenticate my government ID? ID and and basically uh, uh, you know uh, here, here's my ten dollar fee or whatever it is and uh, we are then able to uh, to show a green check next to the geomain name uh, to indicate that this geomain has been validated. Uh, this is something that uh, you know we are happy for the post offices to charge a fee that they wish. We do not do any revenue share of this. Uh, so uh, depending on the local markets and uh, we are. We are in a local uh, uh, situation and the, the post office is free to determine pricing of this if they so choose. 
uh, escrow fees for secondary market transactions. So secondary market transactions are, we feel that in that uh, uh, once uh, geomains start uh, becoming viral, there will be a significant uh, secondary market for geomain names, which is again, very similar to what we have seen with uh, domain names. So domain name market is, uh, as, as, as we all know, um, uh, you know, uh, much, much higher than, than, than this particular figure we've quoted here. Uh, but we feel that secondary market transactions uh, will be there for geomains because a lot of people would want to make a quick buck by buying uh, geomains and then selling them off or auctioning them off. Uh, so every time that a geomain is sold, then an escrow fee needs to be paid because we have a mechanism where uh, geomain would act as an escrow agent uh, itself uh, to facilitate the transfer of a geomain from a, a seller to a new buyer and uh, that escrow fees, which is five uh, percent, is again uh, also shared with the postal uh, with the postal members. Uh, last but not least is a sale of advertising. So every geomain that is a business category geomain would also have. Uh, advertising enabled on their uh, app. So when I visit, uh, if I decide to basically visit uh, your your geo page, uh, then I would be able to see ads running. And if you wish to have those ads showing, then currently two formats are available, a banner and a video campaigns. Uh, and these can all be uh, be, be set up by uh, by those uh, companies that actually own a business category geo. Um, so advertising, again, uh, we all know that uh, the significant amount of uh, monetization that can be uh, made on the advertising side of things. Uh, and uh, whilst we have not uh, predicted anything here, primarily because, uh, uh, you know, we, we at this moment are, are unsure, um, you know, what, what level of adoption advertising will happen. But, uh, but if I were to take an educated guess, I would say that uh, we expect this to be fairly significant. And again, uh, all these advertising revenues will be collected by the post offices and then shared with us. So, uh, this is uh, again just continuing with the quantification. Uh, so uh, this is a bit of uh, you know uh, on the pricing. So uh, we we've actually got three categories of geomains. We've got government category geomains, which are minimum for three years registration at nineteen dollars ninety nine per annum. We've got business category and we've got the personal category. Uh, we also have short and premium geomains which have a surcharge of $9.99 per annum. Uh, then we have got ad revenue. So the banner ads uh, cost about $19.99 and the video ads uh, cost the advertiser about $29.99 per month. Uh, then the validation of the, uh, the, you know, the green check, as I said, we do not charge for this. Uh, pricing can be set by the postal member at will and the escrow fees for secondary geomain sales. So this just is a table that uh, gives you a fair insight into the uh, pricing, uh, which would then help you to uh, you know, get an estimate in terms of exactly uh, what the financial benefits to your post office would be. Okay, uh, let's let's look at the at the total uh, addressable uh, uh, total available market. Uh, you know the uh, the TAM, SAM, and the SOM. So at this moment in time, if we look at this green circle here, we've got a total of three hundred and sixty three million registered domain names. Uh, now, if we assume that all these every single person or company that's registered the domain name is uh, certainly technical savvy enough to have a web presence um, and uh, we we you know we feel that if they are made an offer that well uh, you own uh, let's let's say starcafe.com uh, would you like to buy a matching geomain called star cafe uh, we feel that uh, the vast majority would actually opt uh, for purchasing a matching geomain, uh, especially uh, because if they don't do it and somebody decides to register a, a geomain of their choice, then they will end up having to buy it in the, in the uh, secondary market, which would cost them significantly higher. So, um, uh, however, what we are doing is we're actually just, in the, at least in the, game, you know, the first year, we're assuming that 30% uh, of the uh, of, of of the total 363, we'll actually buy a matching geomain, and that translates to about 109 million uh, geomains that uh, that that could potentially be sold in the first year. Uh, the maximum system capacity that we have at this moment uh, provisioned on our uh, cloud is, is about 800,000 geomain registrations daily. Uh, so that translates to about 292 million. So as we scale up, then we will increase that capacity. Uh, now, if you look at uh, you know 
what does this translate to in terms of uh, the the serviceable obtainable market um, in terms of revenues then that that is north of a billion dollars uh, you know in, in the first year alone if you are able to achieve that 109 million target and then that will obviously go up significantly uh, as as uh, more and more businesses uh, progressively uh, register a matching geomain. Uh, so this 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 revenue that we are seeing here in the blue 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 box is basically uh, the pie that we would like uh, all postal operators to be a part of and to uh, yeah, basically share share with all of you guys. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're coming up to the end. So our, our mission statement really to replace global law firm addresses with uh, geomains by the year 2027. And uh, that's our mission. Uh, we feel that uh, digital addressing is something that is uh, uh, bound to take off and something that is the, the, you know, the need of the hour today. Uh, uh, in the, in, in the world we live in with all the logistics and, and, and the increasing costs, it, it, it makes no sense to, uh, well, it makes great sense to actually switch to a digital uh, format, uh, which can then help uh, increase uh, efficiencies and reduce costs. So we envision a world where uh, Geomin has grown to become the default uh, universal digital identity for the world with UP acting as master registry and regulator, much like ICANN does for domain names and post partners globally earning from sales and services of geomains. So uh, we are all familiar with ICANN and the domain name system. So this is one, one, one way of easily um, uh, understanding, uh, you know, what the model could potentially look like. Um, so if the UPU uh, agrees to act as a master registry and regulator and post partners are, uh, are, are, are then empowered to basically help increase their revenue significantly by becoming uh, registrars and uh, they are able to then uh, you know uh, make uh, uh, unsignificant revenue from the sales and service of geomains so uh, post can also become the custodian for all data of their respective citizens uh, which is again very important there's a um, there's a uh, increasingly uh, 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 loud uh, movement that basically is now calling for all data to reside within national borders it is uh, it is a position that uh, I think we all support in the interest of privacy and security. So um, we, yeah, post offices as they move uh, as, as they move forward and they adopt geomains, uh, the user data for those geomains can reside within uh, postal data centers, can reside within the NIC, uh, insofar as it's within national borders. So this is something that we uh, feel is also very important, and we are open to suggestions from postal partners in terms of how they wish to do this. Um, uh, but the important thing to note is that the that the master registry uh, will still uh, basically uh, be, uh, uh, you know, the UPU. We, I mean, we would like to invite the UPU to be acting as a custodian uh, and uh, and hold the master registry for uh, the geomain. So, while all data uh, uh, under that geomain would reside with within national borders, uh, just a simple registry would have to be uh, held outside, which then uh, is able to resolve. Uh, uh, the queries that we receive uh, for uh, geomains from across the world as uh, post uh, crosses borders and parcels cross borders for delivery. Uh, and all of this we, we, we feel is going to give a significant boost to local economy and it will truly enable uh, digital transformation. Okay, uh, so lastly, uh, founders, that's of course uh, myself. Uh, so Tracy was kind enough to give us a whole uh, brief on that. So thank you very much for that, Tracy. And my uh, colleague uh, who is uh, uh, not here with me today, uh, and uh, his, his name is Hugh Sutherland, he's a co-founder, and uh, his, uh, his, his short bio, brief bio data is there at the end. So um, this, this, this deck will be made available, I believe, to anybody who wishes to have a copy uh, and they can request one from Tracy. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very Sam. much. Uh, You're welcome. And um, what we are about to what do here, about to take some questions. Um, so as I indicated, the way we're doing questions today is utilizing um, primarily the Q&A box. Um, so Earl, I see your hand is up, but we are un unfortunately not able to do verbal questions. So. I want to encourage everyone to use the Q&A function um, to post your questions. And there are already several questions there. Um, so let me um, read um, 
one of them from Agnieszka. Agnieszka is saying, well, she, it'll be great to receive the presentation. So I think that's been covered. Um, but she's asking, are there any data or measurements of how GeoMate influences the costs of last mile delivery? Have you done any pilot studies of post uh, men or delivery companies delivering that way? Is the system meant to replace classical addresses or be used in a hybrid approach? Um, do you want okay, to? Okay. Uh, yes. The short the, the short answer to that is uh, there have been case studies done by Daimler, uh, which is the parent corporation for Mercedes, uh, on a similar technology, which is not as comprehensive as GeoMain, and that has indicated an efficiency gain of minimum fifteen percent. That's one five. Uh, when they use a GPS coordinate to determine an address as opposed to the standard in uh, street address. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Marianne. She's asking, I think it's a she, so how close is the UPU to making a decision to adopt GeoMain? As a U, as a I guess a UDID and ESTAM standard. Well, I'm not sure if um, I can answer that question. Um, so, do you have any any thoughts on that at this point in time? Well, um, to be honest, uh, the thing is, uh, we are in the process of of trying to invite uh, postal partners to do pilots with us, uh, and I believe that the standard process with the UPU is that once uh, uh, certain pilots have been undertaken and uh, and the UPU has studied them in detail, uh, that is when they essentially would be able, would be in a position to endorse a product or a service uh, which can then be rolled out across all postal operators. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that that's the process, Tracy. Is that right? Yeah, so I think, um, so So the, the UPU, as you know, is not um, in the habit of picking winners and losers, but the idea is that we are working with um, the private sector, as I mentioned, to, start to, to sort of, you know, ensure that this technology and this, this, this type of thinking is, is available to the posts. Uh, for example, this is exactly what we are doing today. Um, so right now, as you can see, the UPU is in fact um, through dot post um, allowing and, and offering um, the solution through GeoMain. And you are able to contact GeoMain and their contact information is available to, to, to deal with this. Um, in terms of doing standards and, and getting to that point, I know we have some maybe some colleagues on the on the um, call who might be able to treat with that. I know there's some work being done on that, but it's, it's not something that will be very swift. Uh, let's just say that. Um, so in terms of standardization of of this kind of technology, we are not there yet. Um, but certainly there are but opportunities for um, the post to work with um, companies like GeoMain to you know to roll this out. Um, which is, in fact, how the domain name industry effectively um, works. So you, you work with this particular standard. It's not necessarily the only standard, but it has become the default standard for, for domain names. And um, that's how it, it, it works today. Um, and this is something I think you may, you may want to take a look at as a post. Um, contact um, GeoMain, and they can probably give you some further um, thoughts as to how they see the future Yes. Yes, that's right. I was about to say that. Um, if you look at the technology world, right, it's all about being able to pilot stuff to see how it works before everybody adopts it. So uh, this is the standard process. So, you know, a handful of players come in, they pilot it, they're the first movers, they get the best deal on the table. And then uh, once they've, they, they've gotten it and, we've, and everybody sees the benefit, that, that's being enjoyed and everybody else comes in and joins the club. Uh, so uh, whilst uh, we have been invited uh, as well uh, by the UPU to help them to develop the, the standards for uh, digital addresses, it is something that is in process. And uh, because obviously there's a lot of uh, hard work that goes into this in terms of standards development, it's something that will take several months before that is ready. So what we are doing now is we are simply inviting postal partners uh, to come in and start 
piloting this with us so we can iron out any any inefficiencies or any of the problems that may exist uh, we've already done our own internal tests we're fairly happy with the results uh, but there's nothing like going live so we are talking to a couple of partners at this moment already uh, but uh, i think this is a fantastic platform so thank you very much uh, tracy and the upu for setting this up where we now have a wider exposure across the postal operators globally and we are able to basically or make an open offer to anybody and everybody out there who wants to basically basically uh, try this out and see what the benefits of this are and uh, you know obtain the first mover advantage if you may uh, and all of this is really SaaS and, and tomorrow I'll be doing a deeper dive in terms of the tech, tech side of stuff so uh, for those operators who may be fretting in terms of how the hell are we going to integrate this I can assure you it's a breeze so that's that's probably the last of your worries uh, what we need to really do is we need to in my opinion <coughs> excuse me in my opinion we need to actually focus on uh, on 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 the end game in terms of uh, you know where we are today, uh, we want to make sure that the UPU can uh, can can remain relevant. Postal partners can remain relevant. We can have foot, footfall come back to the post offices. We can have revenue start increasing again. Uh, and uh, this is at this moment, uh, you know, from what we see, uh, Geomint ticks all the right boxes. Uh, for these above, uh, uh, you, know, as I, you know, as I mentioned. So we'd be more than happy to work with any and all postal partners who wish to uh, deploy this on a pilot basis. And you all get the best deal on the table, as I said. Exactly so, and I think that is very important. And I just want to remind everyone that, that what Sol said, this is part one of a two part um, webinar. And tomorrow, some of the questions you may have that might be, let's say more technical, and more of a deep dive, they will be dealt with tomorrow. So I invite everyone who is here today um, for the high level presentation, the business side of it, to join us tomorrow for the technical side. But notwithstanding that, um, there are other questions and I will still pose them today. And um, let me do a bit, give, give a little more um, voice to others. I know Anya has two questions in the chat, but in the Q&A, but I will go to Jean-Marie Lopez first. Um, Jean-Marie is from La Poste um, in France. Jean-Marie is asking, is this solution for e-stamp just for domestic mail delivery or also for outbound mail? Okay, can I answer that? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh if a postal office, if, uh, if if you know, if a postal member decides to adopt e-stamps, then uh, they could do it uh, pretty much overnight uh, for the domestic market, primarily because they they are the sole players within any single country, the post office, right? If you want to be able to make this available cross-border, then the recipient post office has to be able to support e-stamps. So, for example, let's say if the U.S. is offering e-stamps, the USPS hypothetically, uh, but uh, you know, uh, La Poste in France is not offering it then you would not be able to send a a, a e stamped letter or post or parcel uh to to france because la post is not offering does that answer the question no i think we'll wait for la post to put in the chat or or otherwise if there's a follow-up to that um in the meantime while that is going on um, Anyaska is asking how is the issue of flaws solved how the how is the how is the delivery point being identified? Example: in the case of buildings with many meal collection points. Example: different entrance doors. I think this may be something you may want to discuss tomorrow. But if you can answer this today, um, feel free. So she's asking basically uh, in an apartment building with many floors and so on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So essentially, what you're talking about is two and three D. So uh, first thing, uh, very important to remember that GPS technology, by definition, is two dimensional. Uh, there isn't any such thing at the moment available as three D three D technology for GPS. So uh, yes, you uh, what you can do is you can actually get to a specified point uh, using the existing GPS. The 3D, i.e. the floors and what have you, that point is addressed in the app using uh, this novel idea of uh, being able to upload uh, photos, pictures, videos, and text that once you get to a point, how do you actually get to the door? So Geomin is really all about getting you to the door. And the way you do that is when you enter a Geomin into your app and you navigate to a specific point, it'll say, fine, now you're here. Now, please look at the video, look at the, or read the text or, you know, watch the pictures to see how you can get to the door. So without having to call the 
person without having to basically waste time. You look in, in, inside the app and you're able to see all this data that is populated by the recipient him or herself and is updated by the recipient him or herself. Yes, I'd like to echo that. Um, so because I, I, for those who use, um, I don't want to name any vendors here, if you use delivery apps, delivery economy apps, you'll see it's very similar. You you um, put the the flat address, the flat, you know, the, the the text address in, but then there's another layer where the there's interaction between the delivery individual and the the, the recipient about the the, meth, the modality of delivery, you know, where to leave it, um, you know, for example, at my door on this floor, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, leave me as rich as what you're saying about pictures, but certainly. There's another layer, and I think this is an interesting modality that um, folks need to consider um, because for them, as we move to, you know, people living in, um, many people living in in, in, in in combined, you know, living environments, apartment buildings, uh, communities, et cetera, it's, it's a lot more challenging for delivery people to find exactly where you are and, and also even to, to potentially say when you are there to collect things, you know, people like real-time delivery want to schedule things and so on. So this extra layer is something that I think is also quite important um, as you go forward. Just for post to understand why it is that people prefer these other delivery companies, not naming them, and why they um, are so successful um, that they can say deliver at my door, uh, deliver at 4 p.m. versus 5 p.m. as opposed to the post which says, I'm coming, if you're not home, bye-bye. Um, so that's kind of a situation where I think there's an improvement that can be made. And um, it seems as if this is something that can be considered in this application that um, Jamin is referring to. Another question, um, I'll use Manoj here. Manoj is saying, oh, by the way, Jamri says, yes, you answered his question. So thank you. Um, Manoj um, says, if one country adopts Geomain and other countries won't adopt, would it not be a problem in mail transition transmission? So I guess that's an interoperability question. So, so he's asking, you know, if one country adopts Geomain and others don't, uh, how does that work in terms of interoperability? What, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, uh, the way it would work is that those countries that, that do adopt Geomain will start benefiting from all the efficiencies and uh, cost savings that come with using Geomain. Uh, those who do not adopt Geomain, and if, if a Geomain enabled nation has any mail to send to a nation that hasn't adopted Geomain, then it would have to use the existing channels and existing networks. So what I really foresee is that uh, for the next maybe three, four, five years, uh, you will have uh, a, a progressive adoption uh, as uh, more and more postal uh, operators see the benefits of Geomain, they will they will be adopting this progressively. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, so, but yes, it I I certainly see it happening progressively, primarily because uh, the cost savings and efficiencies come into effect from day one. And those post offices that have innovative uh, uh, thinking and uh, you know uh, basically a whole innovative mindset uh, would would want to adopt this, so they can start benefiting from this right away. And they would not really wait for the big guys to to adopt because usually the bigger post offices it's 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 more difficult for them to adopt it primarily because uh, they have so much uh, to basically modify at their end in terms of legacy systems and what have you. So I think the smaller and the medium sized ones could could, could adopt it straight away, uh, and then the bigger ones will eventually come round because uh, the best. Uh, the best way to prove that this uh, works and this saves money and makes money, more importantly for post, is to actually get it up and running. And uh, once they actually see this happening, then I think it will be very easy paid for them to join the club. Thank you very much. So um, Aneska has another question. Um, why does the presentation claim that addresses cannot be verified real time? She is saying that addresses can be verified in real time using various methods and tools, example, API tools. 
the address uh, verifications that you're talking about there are uh, these are services offered by some post offices uh, which uh, actually have these a you know avi apis and whatever uh, you know when we when we talk of uh, you know address verification um, you know those are are there however uh, you know sometimes addresses would change so you you know what you can do is you can you can verify the the location or the existing of a physical address but you cannot verify in real time that the person is still staying there. That's what we mean. All right. And um, Jean-Marie Lopez is asking, um, the e-stamp is compatible with OCR reading. Uh, for those who don't know what OCR is, is optical character recognition. So e-stamp is compatible with OCR reading. But I suppose that the postman needs a smartphone. Thoughts? So? Yes, uh, we believe that once uh, the e-stamp is adopted, then the postman will have a device, uh, which is a smartphone or, 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 or something custom made perhaps as well, uh, that, that we are thinking of, of actually developing uh, for the convenience of postmen, so they can more easily and conveniently uh, deliver post and mail uh, to the right recipient. Uh, so, but but yes, uh, OCR. Uh, since since we uh, since uh, as as I already mentioned, OCR currently exists in pretty much every single post office on the planet. It is something that will uh, that can by all means continue to be there in parallel for a few years, uh, uh, and it is something that would help people in terms of adoption because not everybody would have the capability to actually uh, print an e-stamp. So if they are to just scribble the uh, you know the 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 code uh, the e-stamp a unique ID onto a package or parcel, and if that can serve as a stamp, then nothing like it. All right. Yes, thank you. And I think we've covered all the questions in the Q and A box. Um, there are just there are comments in the chat. So, um, um, for example, a, lot, a comment saying uh, from Al Fauzan. Fauzan, I'm going to pronounce that correctly. Fauzan. This is an excellent development in the post cycle. I commend the UP for this development. Um, there's a French comment. Um, bonjour from, um, I think it's Assan from Senegal. Très heureux de participer à ce webinar très riche et information. Uh, so if my, my basic French says, he's um, very happy to participate in this, in this webinar. And it's very, been very informative. Um, so I think we've had some good feedback. Um, we are just about at the close of our proposed time. So before I hand back over to you, Sula, I just want to remind everyone once again, this is part one of a two-part series of webinars. Tomorrow, there will be part, so it's tomorrow. It's not next week, it's tomorrow. We will have part two, which will be a deep dive. Your Zoom um, invitations, um already in your inbox sorry the zoom information you got a reminder actually during this very webinar like i got mine reminding you that the tomorrow's webinar is, is happening um the links is there i believe it's the same link today but don't please don't quote me on that um it's the link that comes with the rely on your zoom link what comes in your inbox your reminder because that's what you connect to tomorrow um and um, as I said, Sol will be going through, and I don't know if Sol will bring anyone else with him, um, to go through a deep dive of many of the um, issues that were raised today, but going through it in a, from a more technical perspective. So I believe there's something that um, you would want to, um, especially those who've asked all these questions, would want to attend, because you're going to see it now in action and see the technical uh, underpinnings of it and maybe ask some additional questions there. So back to you, Sol, for any final words and thoughts. And I guess you can close off. Yes, I would. I, the only thing I'd add is uh, that, uh, you know, uh, if uh, the people uh, attending today, if they, if they could be kind enough to share the invite with their technical uh, team members, uh, so that would uh, be more productive. Uh, of course, they would be able to more easily understand uh, what a simple uh, solution this really is to deploy and that would help i believe to uh, you know reduce the barriers to entry uh, and uh, help uh, post uh, postal partners to start earning some revenue so, and uh, thank you everybody for your time it was a pleasure to present to you and i look forward to being here tomorrow again 
Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, um, so, so again, one more time, just want to make sure, because I want to make sure everybody understands what's happening here. This is part one of a two-part webinar tomorrow, more technical, a deep dive. And as Sol said, I think it's a great idea that if those who are here today who are maybe not as technical as, um, as some in the organization, feel free to ask your colleagues to come along with you, um, your operational folks, your logistics folks, your techno IT, digital folks come along with you, um, share the, 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 the invitation um, to let them register separately. They can't join you. Of course, they can't reuse the link. It's, in, it's unique links, um, but certainly share the um, invitation and they can register and they can join tomorrow as well. It'll be the same time, um, starts at the same time, finishes at the same time. Um, so hope to see everyone and, and more tomorrow for the technical deep dive on um, GeoMain and Universal Digital ID and the birth of the e-stamp. So with that, um, to say thanks for joining, thanks for your participation, thanks for all your questions and comments. And on behalf of the Dot Post team and the Universal Post Alinean um, and GeoMain, do have a, enjoy the rest of your morning, day, evening, or night, or wherever you are. Bye now. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye bye.